good morning uh, everyone again and uh, let's advance to even more advanced technique now that is robotic surgery which every pediatric surgeons want to do sometimes in their life so this uh, talk it would be given by dr gurusev the most 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 experienced and famous and favorite uh, robotic pediatric surgeon of mumbai and of course everywhere and it will be chaired by dr ravi kanojia professor of pediatric surgery pgi chandigarh and our current uh, secretary iips dr guru you can take over and dr ravi also you can take over uh, thank you so much thank you for the opportunity and uh, i must congratulate the wadia team for organizing such an excellent cme the program looks very promising and it is already off to a great start with this morning session on minimally invasive surgery so i think our previous set of experts have already covered the basics of minimally invasive surgery a lot was talked about the ergonomics the tips and tricks and other basics which are which really it is important to lay the foundation for any kind of approach and you know trying to build up on the advanced techniques so coming to the point of advanced techniques now robotics is is quite a uh, it's i would not say it's a new thing now it has been there for quite some time and for the sake of pro post graduates we would like to through the talk of dr gursev you know enlighten them and give some basics about the uh, use of robotics in pediatric surgery robotic in itself is is quite a technical thing and uh, it requires a, a sort of a training uh, once you have graduated from the basics of minimally invasive surgery and uh, you often need to learn the hardware first before you can actually go and attempt a robotic procedure in any patient so i'm sure uh, dr gursev is going to uh, you cover up on those aspects as well as the indications the advantages and uh, the benefits of applying robotic surgery in pediatric patients so without any further delay i will hand over the uh, stage to dr gursev you can share your uh, screen now dr gursev and he can start with his presentations we can have the questions uh, while he is giving his presentation in the chat box and we'll try to cover them at the end over to you dr gursev uh, thank you thank you dr ravi um, for such a wonderful introduction to robotic surgery and uh, thank you to dr pradnya ma'am for uh, my gracious introduction so uh, what i'm going to present today would be uh, an introduction to pediatric robotic surgery for uh, beginners uh, who either have no background or have very little information about uh, pediatric uh, robotic surgery uh, first of all as dr ravi rightly pointed out pediatric robotic surgery is no longer new it's been around for more than 21 years and uh, even advanced robotic surgery has been more than a decade old even in our country in fact uh, but yes uh, it comes with a rider that the growth has been primarily driven by pediatric urologists both in us europe and in the initial years in india as well but uh, and even today i would say most of the advanced procedures that are done are urological procedures though we are now exploring uh, hepatobiliary and other techniques uh, as to what other reconstructions can be done uh, with robotics then uh, moving on sorry just give me a second yeah uh, so that was just a timeline of procedures like i said uh, the first pyroplasty was done by craig peters way back in 2002 and then we have had advanced robotics being uh, you know kind of given a real push by uh, by dr gundetti uh, starting from 2008 onwards uh, uh, me along with dr ravi have a few first to our credit uh, he is credited with the first robotic tef repair in the country and i'm really proud of that uh, but yes we have been you know together trying to push the envelope forward and uh, trying to get more and more indications for robotics uh, justifiably so uh, then the question everybody asks us is why pediatric robotics uh, the my answer to them is in these first two lines that robotic assistance is actually ideally suited for pediatric patients a robot thrives in a confined space in fact that's where its origins were in in pelvic surgery in the form of a radical prostatectomy which was Uh, a difficult surgery even to do uh, as an open procedure uh, we have small organs we do predominantly reconstructive work which needs extensive suturing we don't have uh, the the luxury of having too many staplers available to us and uh, as i already said non neurological robotic pediatric surgery has been exploded very few centers worldwide 
uh, what can be done honestly anything and everything today can be done with robotic uh, within your ethical and uh, skill limits uh, the common procedures that we do uh, today uh, i think two most common procedures then are pyeloplasties and ureteric implants which can be both vasciloscopic and extravasical implants depending upon the indication uh, colidocal cyst again is coming up as uh, the probably third most common procedure that we end up doing Uh, other hepatobiliary reconstructions like bypasses, hepatic resections, pancreatic reconstruction, fundoplications, tracheoesophageal fistulas, so elegantly demonstrated by Dr. Ravi. Uh, then duplication cells, bladder neck reconstruction again has has given us tremendous benefit of robot, as I'll show in the subsequent video. Uh, to be very honest, any procedure which can be done lab today can be done with robot assistance. However, the size does preclude us from. Uh, the size of the instruments preclude us from going too small i mean uh, uh, the smallest case we have done is about a 35 day old uh, pyeloplasty and of course dr we has done a, a neonate as well but uh, that can be a real challenge and, and that's something that is advanced practitioners i would say but then moving on what is the general structure of a robot uh, so a robot has three parts the first part being uh, the main instrument tower uh, the si1 had uh, the it always has four arms uh the si1 which was third generation robot uh, had it mounted on a tower if you can see the difference between the two uh, uh, pictures uh the tower mounted assembly though initially very good had its own uh, limitations uh docking was a little difficult you had to be very pinpoint accurate with your port placements uh, to ensure that you get a good docking in these patients um uh, thankfully and it couldn't be rotated once you had it fixed it was fixed and and then you couldn't operate on two different quadrants without undocking the the robot and and kind of redocking it in a completely different way all those um, uh, you know limitations were kind of addressed in in the next generation which is the xi and uh, xi has a overhead pendant mounted system which can extend it retract it can rotate all four arms and uh, that kind of uh, you know uh, gave a flip to the whole uh, docking uh, conundrum that we had in the past uh, which is where a lot of people used to face trouble in the beginning of robotic learning curve is to dock the robot properly so that you don't have you know arm clashes instrument clashes happening and you have the full range of movement available to you uh, then of course the third uh, the fifth generation is really really exciting uh, the single port system where it has condensed all these four arms into a single 2.5 cm diameter tube and the whole thing can rotate in all dimensions literally and uh, of course it's not yet approved for uh, you know it uh, use very freely there are a few center which are running stage 4 trials for pediatrics uh, it is only approved for a partial nephrectomy in adults so far um, but it's 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 on the horizon i would say then the second part is the surgeon's console we are going to sit uh so you have a, a view finder that you see in the binocular right at the top it gives you a nice imax dome kind of a view 180 degree view which honestly you have to see to be to to really understand what i'm talking about it, no no two dimensional screen can justify that kind of a view uh then you have the armrest the two controllers in your hand and the foot pedals so uh, if you look at the foot pedals it will have about five uh pedals there the right ones the yellow and the blue are for the right and the left hand instrument uh, monopolar and bipolar and uh, the clutch pedal is for uh, adjusting the arms rest with your instruments uh, the camera pedal is for adjusting the camera because unlike um, in in laparoscopy where you have an assistant holding your camera the camera is held by a robotic arm and, and that kind of gives you good steady vision and then you have the toggle pedal on the left where you if you are using three uh, operating instruments you can toggle between any two at one point of time you can't have control of more than two instruments at one point of time and if you are if you are adjusting the camera no instrument moves on its own so uh, that's the control panel uh, moving on uh, the next is of course uh, the interface between these two uh, which is the tower uh, i'm sorry i'm just having some trouble moving this forward so uh, the control tower is actually the cpu of the whole central processing unit which kind of holds everything together and uh, that relays the information from uh, the camera system or the robotic arms to the console 
and carries the system uh, the the information back from the console surgeon's console to the robotic arms there you go so that's that's the central um, uh, control panel and that's actually the brains of the whole thing and uh, that controls the movement information movement to and fro then moving on uh, Yeah, so that's uh, how a typical robotic OT setup would be. The patient would be in the center. Uh, the anesthesia machine is to his right. This is a typical left fibroplasty setup. Uh, the robotic arms would be then wheeled in to be docked. The surgeon console is right to the end where you'll be sitting and operating these patients. And then this is uh, how a final um, picture would look like. You have the arms docked in. Uh, the glow is in the abdomen. You can see the screen. There are three screens on with through which the, your assistants can have a look. And the surgeon is sitting on the console and operating. Uh, this is a very small uh, docking video that I wish to share because uh, the initial days, a lot of criticism about robotics that uh, the docking takes a long time. Uh, well, that's true for any uh, new technique that you begin. You know, there is a certain learning curve to every uh, new technique that you learn, whether it is open surgery, whether it is laparoscopy or whether it is uh, robotics. But once you have mastered the technique, once you have had the same set of people working for you, uh, then docking becomes that much easier. You know? Our average docking times for uh, each surgery is now down to about uh, four to five minutes, uh, whereas it used to take us about 20, 25 minutes when we started. So. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's an unfair criticism when it comes to docking uh, a robot. A docking and undocking can be a simple five minute and a two minute procedure. Uh, once you have got your basics right and once your entire team has had that learning curve done, because if you notice, this is the robotic assistant and the nurse who are actually docking the robot and not the operating surgeon. So it's a teamwork. It can't be done by a single person. You need an entire team of trained people who would help you in, in, in making sure that you have a successful robotic program. Uh, when it comes to instruments, yes, in the beginning we were limited, but with the advent of XI, I think uh, the instrument range is phenomenal today. You have Maryland forceps, you have scissors, monopolar scissors, you have big needle driver, you have a needle driver with a, a suture cut scissor built into it, you have tentaculum forceps, you have uh, harmonic scalpels now available, bowel graspers of all kinds and types. So uh, I would say uh, the entire range of instruments that you would have for laparoscopy are today available with robotics, including staplers. So you have robotic staplers, robotic chemo clip applicators, and harmonic shields, which are now available. And I think they're tremendously useful if you're doing a liver section, the harmonic shears. So uh, this is just a small video to demonstrate the range of movement of these arms. I will try and play it on a loop for all of you to appreciate the amount of articulation and movement that this uh, instrument set can achieve for you. So I'll just play it again. Just have a look how much of articulation you can get from these instruments. Uh, in fact, um, if you go by the company brochure, they say that the range of is uh, what they call the endo wrist is better than the wrist movement of your own human hand. And I think that gives you unbelievable amount of flexibility in complex reconstruction. I will not say a robot is justified for doing a gallbladder or an appendix, but if you have a tough collateral cyst, a tough redo pyroplasty, this is the way uh, to go if possible. Then uh, this is a very standard chart where uh, you know you compare robotic laparoscopy and open techniques. Uh, of these, I think the, the three most important things that I would like to point out is one is the motion. Uh, see, uh, laparoscopy gives you a counterintuitive motion where we talk about the fulcrum principles. So you move your hand to the right on the outside, the instrument moves to the left. Now, this is an adaptation that your brain has to do and it's actually a part of the learning curve. Some of them may find it shorter, they adapt very easily. Some of them take time to adapt. So in robotic, the movement is intuitive. So if you move your hand to left, the instrument moves to left. If you move your hand to right, the instrument moves to right. Second, of course, is the tremors. The tremors are not transmitted because it's a motorized robotic system. And third, most important thing which I found once you start doing very advanced laparoscopy at one month or two months of age is the motion scaling. So in robotics, you can actually have the instrument uh, programmed 
to move say only 1 cm for every 3 cm movement of your instrument so you are making gross movements on the outside but it translates into a much finer movement on the inside and what it does is it prevents small muscle fatigue of your hands which i think a lot of us who are doing advanced laparoscopy especially my seniors would agree that it tends to set in in long surgeries and this is where the motion scaling i think helps uh, to overcome that barrier uh, the magnification the depth perception 3d vision it's available in laparoscopy as well but uh, i think these are the two three properties of robot which really make it stand apart from uh, laparoscopy to an extent disadvantages uh, most important complete lack of haptic feedback you have to have only visual cues how far can you stretch the tissue before it tears how strong are you going to make that knot before you think it is too tight or too loose too tight you may end up breaking the suture too loose you may not achieve the desired result so all this has to be translated from visual cues the blanching of the tissue the stretch on the suture material uh, i think and that plays a big part in your learning curve the faster you adapt to this visual cues as your haptic feedback the faster you become adept with robotics extreme degree of situational awareness because you just can't afford your instrument going out of your vision because you don't know what is going to hit because there is no resistance that you're going to feel on that instrument so your your focus has to be within you have to work in that square uh, you know space that is available to you and make sure that your instruments are under vision all the time technical errors uh, yes they have cropped up where you know the robot freezes it's eventually a machine but but the the safe cards that have been built in is it just freezes it causes no independent movement we have once had an robot overheat and shut down when it was on the fourth or fifth case of the day but the moment you restart everything works out um, i call it a, a disadvantage that it's habit forming because once you've done a corridocal cyst sitting on a robot it's very difficult to go back to laparoscopy and and struggle to do those suturing again uh is it expensive well um not so much anymore uh, we have you know bring brought down the cost with volumes and of course since 2019 onwards uh, robotic surgery and internal congenital anomaly in children are now covered by insurance and and that has catch, actually you know boosted our numbers by nearly 30% uh, per year now uh, thanks to the availability of insurance coverage i'll just show you quite small clips just to demonstrate the capabilities and vision that a robotic can afford so that's an open bladder and we are doing a bladder neck reconstruction uh, a classical um, tdl uh, this kind of vision this kind of uh, magnification and instrument flexibility is not possible either by open even with the use of loops we have done this before with using loops and it doesn't give you the same uh, you know the light the magnification is unparalleled uh, suturing in the depth of pelvis is, has always been an achilles heel of laparoscopic instruments and i think this is where uh, the robot takes the game away from it uh, i'm not saying you can't do a good job laparoscopically you can but uh, the quality of repair when i sit back and compare my results of laparoscopy and robotic the quality of repair turns out superior at least to me uh, between laparoscopy and robotics uh, for such complex cases then uh, this is of course uh, how you construct a mitrofinop it's a part of the same surgery uh, that we were doing and uh, you know these are um, i'm showing is non standard surgery spinoplasty uretral implant there are enough videos available on internet at dr ravi's channel my channel and and uh, you know enough material is available but these are some of those uh, uh, techniques which are not covered bowel anastomosis again extra mucosal bowel anastomosis becomes fantastically easy uh, with the vision and magnification available to you and uh, that's how you, uh, you you kind of end up doing uh, that uh, this is of course a uh, uh, a bowery flap that we had made uh, for constructing a complete uh, urethral reconstruction in a horseshoe kidney with a left sided uh, urethral hypoplasia in that boy and we realized that it better of no use and uh, you know that that's the flexibility of robotic platform of horse that uh, you can actually end up uh, doing this uh, in a fairly competitive way at the end of the day uh, why i'm showing you most of the pelvic surgeries is because that is where these articulation of these instruments Uh, stands apart from 
uh, you know, your regular instruments and the vision stands apart from the vision that you get in open surgeries in these cases. And, uh, you know, as, as I had already spoken about that, our most of our work is predominantly extensive suturing. Uh, and I think uh, even to me, uh, you know, intracorporeal suturing was a big step in learning in laparoscopy. I'm, I'm not talking about others, but uh, I think Dr. Ramesh knows this. I, I, I visited his center to learn intracorporeal suturing because I found that to be a, a, a big uh, step up for me when it came to laparoscopic surgery. And then robotic makes it uh, look so simple. Uh, and that's probably because of the articulation. So that learning curve that is needed in, in, in laparoscopy for suturing is not so difficult a curve uh, in robotics. And, and that's because of the aid of the articulation that the instruments provide. And, and that's the completed urethral tube then. Uh, I think there is a shift of paradigm and this would be the decade for it. Robotic assistance is the fastest growing technology today in surgery in all fields, whether it is uro-onco, it is gynec onco cold urology, cold gynecology, uh, colorectal surgery. Tata is doing a phenomenal job when it comes to uh, you know colorectal cancer surgery with robotics. Laparoscopy is the standard of care today, uh, but there is evidence emerging that robotic eye outcomes do match open surgery outcomes with a benefit of a much shorter hospital stay and early mobilization in these patients. Uh, and of course, uh, this is what I talked about earlier. Single port robotics, I think, will revolutionize pediatric surgery, if no other branch. You have condensed that entire tower into a 2.5 centimeter tube. Uh, with three instruments and a camera, which affords you three-dimensional vision. You can rotate it, put it through the umbilicus, rotate it anyhow you want and operate any compartment of the abdomen or the thorax with the advantages that the bigger robots used to give you. So I think it's a single port robotics which, which will change this decade for pediatric surgery. A future is very bright. There are multiple platforms. In fact, uh, CMR's Versius system has been installed in nearly 10 places in India already. And that actually mimics uh, the 3D laparoscopic experience very much. So people find it much easier to shift on to a Versius system as compared to DaVinci from whatever. I have got the feedback from the users of the Versius system. But there are many, you know, the, um, the Medtronic is really around the corner. Uh, Titan should be here in three, four years probably. Uh, and I think once you have competition coming in, the price of these machines are going to go down and will make it more cost effective to buy and operate these machines and uh, for the hospital as well as for, uh, for users. So thank you very much. I, I hope uh, I have answered most of your questions about uh, robotics. And if there are any questions, I'll, I and Dr. Ravi would be glad to pick them up from there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gursev, for that an enlightening talk. I think the purpose of this session was that if our postgraduates get a 10 mark long answer question in their theory exam, they should be able to answer this after seeing your presentation. And I think you have done a job very well. So uh, with that, I will leave the floor open for questions. There are a few coming in in the, in the chat box. Before we go on to the uh, questions uh, for the postgraduates, I think the crux of matter what Dr. Gursev highlighted was that with the robot, the key advantages is of articulation, better suturing and better ergonomics uh, for, for the surgeon. One thing to remember is uh, while you are handling the robot is that it is not the robot who, which is doing the surgery. It is the surgeon who is doing the robot and robot is just a telemanipulator for the surgeon. And at the end of the day, it is the skill of the surgeon which is going to dictate each and everything happening in the uh, operating theater with your robot. So that is the basic thing which, you, which everybody has to keep in mind. And uh, to add to this, I would say that one of the important future prospects of a, of a robot in your theater uh, with which this technology was initially thought of was of telesurgery. So right now we have the robot and the surgeon sitting in the same room, but I think we are not very far from the future where the surgeon would be in one continent and the patient would be in the other continent. There have been few experimental runs uh, in the world with these kind of procedures where the, both the people, the console and the patient are at different places and they have been uh, quite successful. So we, we will see that sometime soon. Uh, there is a question about the uh, CMR surgical, which Dr. Gursev mentioned that do any of us have got uh, any experience with these, any of these new robots? 
but i don't maybe dr gursev can uh, tell more about that I, i have had the experience of talking to those people i've seen the 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 system uh, per se uh, and i've spoken to them so um, it's it's more of an open system it's not a closed system if if any of you have seen a 3d laparoscopic setup it looks very similar the screen is distant from you you have to wear a glasses to get that 3d vision the the hand controls are also similar to laparoscopic instrument controls and it's more of a, a, a you know here we have all four arms mounted on a single tower there they have it mounted on separate towers so uh, you know you can individually use only two arms if you wish to you can use only three arms if you wish to if you have a complex surgery long surgery and you want only the camera to be held by him and you want to do a laparoscopic surgery so the cross platform compatibility is better with bursches if that's what you're talking about but if you're talking to me as a as a surgeon what is my experience i think da vinci still gives you a better and superior overall experience as compared to the versius platform as of now maybe when the second generation versius comes out maybe it will be much better than what it is today but today uh, if it is pure laparos robotic surgery we're talking about da vinci still holds the edge yeah so da vinci has been there in the market for enough length of time to evolve and i think this is at least the fourth or the fifth iteration of da vinci which we are using uh, on a commercial basis even the earlier versions of da vinci were not that good enough but they evolved and improved on their technology there is one question in the chat box one of our student is asking are there any absolute contraindications for robotic surgery in pediatric cases so uh specifically for robotics i don't think so uh, if there are any contraindications for doing laparoscopic surgery or or should i put it this way we had one experience now that i remember if your child child does not tolerate pneumoperitoneum so we once had a, a 45 day old infant who did not tolerate the pneumoperitoneum he would just desaturate immediately even at pressure of 4 or 5 and and that's where we thought if we can't do robotic we can't even do laparoscopy because it's just not tolerating the pneumoperitoneum so i think that would be a relative contraindication if i can if i can say it but otherwise any other uh, relative indications that you have for any laparoscopic or open surgery the same applies to robotics uh, there won't be any absolute contraindication i, I don't think so dr ravi what do you think uh, yeah i i agree that it robotic at the end of the day is a minimally invasive surgery and any indication or contraindication which you can apply for a laparoscopic procedure the same goes for robotic procedures i would just add that you you just or don't overdo or apply the robotic platform to simple cases where uh, you know you can save the cost by just so if i have seen people doing lap coles uh, by robot the appendix by robot it's a kind of an overkill uh, to to use the robot in such scenarios when you know that the same thing can be used for places where like dr gursev showed the bladder neck area the pelvis so anything at the extremes of your abdomen say the esophageal hiatus and the pelvic area they they are the places where you should apply and use the advantages of the articulation of the robot but not for simple surgery so there are no uh, i agree there are no absolute contraindications per se correct so uh, there is a comment about the day care procedures can the robot uh, uh, applications are capable of giving a day care kind of services uh, mm. to the procedure yeah. we are we are actually moving towards that i would say uh, for a day care pyeloplasty to be done uh, you know uh, we are currently uh, discharging them in 24 to 36 hours but we are shortly moving towards maybe offering a day care robotic surgery for a urethra implant or a or a pyeloplasty as long as they are uh, you know from the city itself where we can follow them up uh, see these things sound very nice but you know then you are bordering on Uh, limits of safety and uh, ethics in these patients you know are you going to send him home just because you want a tag of take care robotic surgery so i i don't think so can it be done yes should it be done i am not so sure we are moving towards that when we reach there hopefully maybe next year when i take this lecture maybe i'll be talking to you about take care robotic surgery yeah yeah i think so far pyeloplasty and reimplantations are are the procedures where you can think of especially the pyeloplasty because day care means that you have got to discharge the patient within 24 hours so if you are operating the patient on a monday morning he can go home on tuesday morning which counts as a day care so it's not like that you operate and discharge within 4 hours so that does not falls into into the definition right. of day care but that is certainly happening with the pyelo both laparoscopic pyeloplasties as well as robotic uh, 
broadcasting. So uh, last question, uh, we are running out of time. So Bursay, what are the training opportunities that are available in India? I know that you uh, are providing one. So can you throw some light yeah, on that? So, so we have an integrated uh, fellowship program for lab and robotic both, uh, which is fairly flexible. Uh, but there are a lot of centers. Uh, Amrita and Cochin is offering one. Uh, and I believe you're going to start one shortly, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Uh, I did my training in, with Dr. Gundetti at uh, Chicago. Uh, it's, a, it's a mini fellowship uh, for about five days, very structured program. But uh, I would still recommend that, uh, you know, you need to spend time with the robot. Uh, five days was enough for me because I had previous experience with Dr. Jayanti at uh, Nationwide Children's for about three months. Uh, so for me, that five day refresher was enough. But uh, for somebody who wants to start a robotic program, five days is not enough. A month, two months, three months is what I would recommend bare minimum uh, to understand the robotics. Yeah. So at, at the moment, I think uh, structured certified courses for a robotic surgery are at very, I would say one or two. One is what Dr. Gursev is mentioning at this place. And other than that, if you if you have to do go and do a, uh, do a robotic surgery and become a robotic certified, Dervinci certified surgeon, you have to do their uh, one or a two day course with the, with the robotic people, with the Dervinci people, who will certify you. This, it's just like a driving test to get a driving license and, and they certify you in a day's time. Before that, they will obviously train you with the hardware and all the things. So, so that, that needs to be done and it's a legal requirement actually. But I would say that it is, it is mostly through personal mentoring. So you can just you know, talk to me or Dr. Gursay or any other uh, robotic surgeons in India and tie up and spend some time with them, go and see that place, work with them for a few days. Uh, that, that is also an opportunity which is available at quite a few places. So thank you, Dr. Gursev. I, I think uh, we have finished uh, in 30 minutes time and that was really an enlightening. I hope all the postgraduates would be benefiting from your presentation. And I'm sure this will be available as a recording later on for everybody to see. So thank you. Back to uh, 